everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're not sure if we're supposed to wait for a facilitator um, to introduce us, so we can go ahead and introduce <laughs> ourselves. Um, hi, I'm Sophia Genovese. I'm a supervising attorney and EJW Disaster Resilience Fellow at the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, and I'm joined by my lovely colleague. Hello everyone, my name is Anna Trillo. I'm also an Equal Justice Resilience Fellow at New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. And we have a third DRP Fellow who works with us on our team, Taylor Noya, who unfortunately is sick and wasn't able to make it to this panel today. I hope we do her justice, uh, but together we are a three fellow team. We work on asylum protection, immigration detention representation and advocacy as well as housing, specifically providing representation to undocumented folks who do not qualify for free legal aid because of their immigration status. The focus of our presentation today is responding to the disaster that is immigration detention and looking at it through the approach, the unique approach that New Mexico takes when addressing these systemic issues. I am not an expert in movement lawyering. However, for the past six years, I have worked directly alongside my clients, directly impacted folks, community organizers, in uniquely addressing the harms that occur in immigration law and specifically in immigration detention. And the focus is not lawyers or the law. The lawyers certainly have a part. There's a way to help in movements, but we are not the focus of the movement. Our clients are. And so we, we want to address um, those specific harms and again, address the, the unique lens we, we do this work. Uh, we do want to review the complex history and legal authority under our immigration laws because it's really relevant for how that informs not only our lawyering at NMILC, but how we respond to different issues in the movement for immigration justice. Um, so, I've given quite a few variations of this presentation before. Uh, the history of immigration detention is really complex. It can usually take three hours just to cover that subject alone, but it's really important and vital to this discussion, and we're going to get it through pretty quickly here. I want to start from the first immigration law in the United States, which is the 1790 Naturalization Act. And what this act did was literally exclude non-white people from being able to become citizens. The language of the law limited naturalization to, quote, free white persons of good character, thus in excluding native peoples, indentured servants, enslaved peoples, and even free black people and Asian people. Uh, let's also not forget European settlers' mistreatment of native peoples and their exclusion from self-determination, which predates this Naturalization Act, but certainly informed the exclusionary um, policies that persisted, the exclusion of non-white people from becoming citizens on stolen land. And the same thing goes for enslaved peoples, largely from Africa. They were trafficked into the US, denied access to citizenship, amongst other protections. And this early exclusion set the stage for further exclusions to come. And they just build and build and build. Uh, there were a, a number of naturalization acts that followed in 1795, 1798, and 1802, which further restricted access to not only citizenship, but now also residency, and continued to exclude people of color. Uh, culturally in America, we saw xenophobia inform and be informed by immigration laws and other laws that targeted uh, migrant communities. We saw state laws, such as the anti-vagrancy laws in California, um, which directly targeted Mexican migrants and Mexican Americans and criminalized everyday behavior and sought to exclude Mex Mexicans from profiting off of mining and farming labor and was a pipeline for deportation. And later, nationally, Congress passed the Immigration Act of 1875, better known as the Asian Exclusion Act, which effectively began a ban of safe migration for most migrants from the Asian continent. And then we have the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act explicitly banning Chinese immigrants and barring naturalization or citizenship to Chinese individuals already living here. And through the rest of the 1890s and 1900s, we see more and more exclusions. Um, we see those exclusions directly impacting first Asian migrants, black people who are either migrants but also descendants of enslaved peoples being prevented from citizenship, and people from South and Central America. 
and we introduced national quotas which restricted uh, immigration from many countries and favored Western European countries, disfavoring everyone else. And along with this, we see an uptick in xenophobia and a fear of the other, the fear of the migrant. And moving quickly along to the 1980s and the 90s, Congress began to expand the authority to detain and deport more than ever before. At the same time, it, it became more difficult to obtain lawful immigration status and added new restrictions and exclusions that predominantly, again, impacted people of color. So what we have here is this massive infrastructure that makes it exponentially more difficult to get status in, these country, in this country, and these barriers are rooted in long, deep history of racism and xenophobia. And this is really important to keep in mind as we address what is currently happening today. And along with these exclusionary policies is enforcement and detention. You have exclusionary policies, how is it going to be enforced? And it's important to look at the, the development of this through the lens of the uh, history of the U.S. Border Patrol. So the U.S. Border Patrol was created by the law I was discussing earlier, the 1924 Immigration Act. Um, and it's worth noting that this act, the 1924 Act, was even praised by Adolf Hitler himself as something he looked to as a model for his ensuing genocide of Jewish peoples. So a really incredibly dangerous, racist act, violent act. Again, it eliminated migration from Asia predominantly um, and excluded uh, immigration from other countries as well, implementing this quota system. One thing the act did not do, though, was ban Mexican migration. And this was largely because of needs across the Southwest in particular for Mexi Mexican migrant labor. And white nationalists were quite angered by this. And a compromise that was reached was the creation of the U.S. Border Patrol. The U.S. Border Patrol um, essentially became a site for race vigilantism. We saw former Texas Rangers become part of the Border Patrol, former and current Ku Klux Klan members become part of the Border uh, Patrol. Um, and to no one's surprise, it was incredibly violent. Uh, we, it was a bunch of white supremacists running something that wasn't, there was no oversight, um, there was no guidance. And so agents regularly beat, shot, and hung migrants with regularity. Women and girls were sexually brutalized. And there's many cruelties and brutalities that occurred over the history of Border Patrol that continue until today. We continue to see the drownings of children and families, shootings of migrants in the back, and sexual assaults. And so what we want to convey is that these aren't one-off occurrences either, but are systemic and purposeful, built on this long history of exclusion, racism, and xenophobia, meant to instill fear in migrant communities. And our government has signed off on it over and over again. And we continue to see these brutalities even up until today. During the Obama administration, for example, on average, at least one Border Patrol agent was arrested every single day during his tenure because of uh, different uh, violations against migrants as well as other unlawful activity. And we continue to see calls from the Border Patrol in particular to further militarize the border, and only violence would follow. And so we look to what follows after border patrol and enforcement, which of course is immigration detention. We're finally at what our subject is, but this history is so important. Um, and immigration detention is overseen by ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. This is an agency that was found in the wake of 9-11. It is an agency younger than all of us. And since then, there have been nearly 150 deaths in immigration detention in that short amount of time. Immigration detention existed, of course, before 9-11. It became, uh, it was starting to be used in the 1890s, first at Ellis Island, which predominantly detained European migrants, and also Angel Bay Island in San Francisco, which detained Asian migrants predominantly. And there were makeshift detention centers and camps all along the southern border meant to detain predominantly Mexican migrants early on, and increasingly over time, those from Central and South America. And the conditions, as you can imagine, were horrific, and they continue to be, and Anna will talk about that in, in just a moment. But in 1954, President Eisenhower closed the vast majority of immigration detention facilities in the U.S. 
not necessarily for altruistic reasons, but due to the high cost of operating expenses. So essentially from the 1950s through the 80s, the US wasn't really detaining immigrants. But then we had a series of laws which dramatically changed this landscape. And here's a chart just to visualize the, the growth and expansion of the carceral state over the past 30 years. But in the, the 80s and 90s, as mentioned in the previous slide, Congress under the Reagan, first Bush, and Clinton administrations began to expand the authority and capacity to detain immigrants. These laws also significantly limited folks' ability to obtain lawful immigration status. And again, this increased focus on excluding, detaining, and deporting was in large part due to the US's manufactured war on drugs, fixation on mass incarceration, the prolifer proliferation of private prison companies, and subsequent lobbying from those companies to detain and deport more people than ever before. And a few really important key events that you can kind of see highlighted on this chart in 1988, which is really the start of, of all of this, is under George H.W. Bush, we have the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. It created the concept of mandatory detention for civil immigration confinement, um, and specifically created a term of art called aggravated felony. And it's a complicated term. That is a whole CLE in and of itself, but essentially double and triple uh, uh, the punishment of migrants who had had some sort of interaction with the criminal legal system. And it's double and triple punishing them, of course, because they first go through the criminal legal system, are subjected to those brutalities there, transferred to immigration detention, suffer the brutalities there, and again, deported. So that's three punishments for one action. During the Clinton administration, we had the introduction of two more laws, which dramatically expanded the concept of criminal non-citizens, increased funding for enforcement, and created more barriers, again, to folks getting status, setting it up a stage where more and more people will be without immigration status and undocumented. The two laws were on the previous slide. It's the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996 and the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. Um, there's a lot of other laws that have come since then, but these two laws are the least favorite amongst immigration practitioners because it has caused all the havoc we are forced to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, it increased enforcement, decreased ability to regularize your status, and increased the number of deportations we saw. Um, so immigration detention continued to increase steadily under the second Bush administration. Obama continued to detain immigrants and families throughout his administration, but at the highest rate seen at that point, while simultaneously also deporting more immigrants than ever before. Under Trump, there is an even sharper increase in the number of immigrants who were detained, climbing to about 56,000 individuals detained per day by mid-2019, uh, with a total of over half a million immigrants detained throughout that year. But due to the multiple asylum bans you all may have seen in the news, as well as COVID-19, that prison population began to shrink towards the end of 2019 and early 2020 when COVID hit. And in fact, the population, the ICE detention population, dropped to just under 10,000 people when Trump left office in, in January 2021. So a really, really significant decrease. But unfortunately, um, under the Biden administration, we have seen the ICE population begin to grow again. As of March 13th of this week, uh, the number has climbed back up to 28,000 individuals in ICE custody. And in immigration law, we have three big immigration statutes dictating the detention and caging of migrants and asylum seekers. You can see them on your screen. Um, INA 236A and C deal with two different situations. So 236A deals with people who are in removal proceedings. So these are your regular asylum seekers coming to the border, requesting assistance, placed in immigration um, removal proceedings and perhaps in detention as well, the statute says that there is discretion to release them on bond or their own recognizance. By contrast, 236C deals with mandatory detention. Um, this is having to do with someone who has had perhaps contact with the criminal legal system or there is a risk of um, terrorism-related grounds. But it's worth noting quickly that to be subject to mandatory detention does not require a conviction from the criminal legal system. I've had many clients with pending drug charges who are released on bond, and then they are picked up by ICE, put in ICE detention, 
and there are criminal cases ongoing while they're also fighting a deportation case. And when we try to seek bond for this individual, ICE, the ICE government attorney that we refer to as OPLA, Office of the Principal Legal Advisor, comes back and says, there's a reason to believe that this person is a drug trafficker, even on a simple possession charge. And ICE gets away with this regularly because it doesn't require a conviction, it just requires a reasonable suspicion that this person is um, a drug trafficker. And they often win these cases, despite the fact that there's no evidence, they bring in things. Uh, we're, it's worth noting in immigration court, we are not um, under the federal rules of evidence. It's kind of just everything goes. And so regularly, police reports with inaccurate information makes it, its way into the immigration record. And that leads to the deprivation of bonds and frequently an order of deportation all before someone's criminal case has even been concluded. So it's a, it's a much broader statute than, than it may seem. INA 235, and I should step back and say INA is the Immigration and Nationality Act. That is the governing law that we deal with every day. Um, so 235 deals with asylum seekers who appear at ports of entry. So these aren't folks going through the river or the desert. These are folks going to a port of entry along the border and going to an immigration official and saying, I would like to seek asylum. Um, they are designated as arriving aliens. We hate using the term aliens. That's not a proper term for us, so we use arriving non-citizens, but on paperwork it says aliens. Um, and under, under this reading of the statute right now, under existing case law, um, these folks are subjected to mandatory detention. ICE has the discretion to release them, but an immigration court is not enabled to are empowered to grant bond. So what we see is many, many asylum seekers languishing in detention for six, eight months, nine months at a time um, in, in really horrific conditions. And lastly, 241 um, mandates that anyone who has received an order of deportation already and that deportation has exhausted all appeals can be detained um, for up to 90 days. That is what's known as the removal period, and they cannot be released during that time. At the 90-day mark, their custody is reviewed. It's frequently justified. Uh, detention is frequently justified after the 90 days because we are deporting a lot of people and there are not enough flights. And so what we see are people waiting upwards of six months just to be deported. And in terms of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, despite all of this horrific case law and, and uh, statutes, uh, is we try to get as many people out of detention as possible. And this is the focus of our detention programming, really, because you are more likely to find legal representation, more likely to receive services in preparation, um, gather evidence for your case from the outside of detention than when you're inside detention. And there is no right to counsel they're appointed counsel, free counsel in immigration detention. And so that means frequently people are navigating this system alone. And that's just another barrier on top of the myriad of barriers already that exist within carceral settings. Um, and not to mention over 90% of the time in immigration detention, people are denied relief, meaning they're denied asylum and deported despite having very viable claims to, to status. And this is compared to non-detained immigration courts where people are granted relief about 50% of the time if they're represented. So achieving liberation is, is really central to what we do and it's so critical for someone's ability to be able to stay in this country and, and seek safety. There are three ways to obtain release from ICE custody. The first is asking ICE to exercise their discretion. There are about half a dozen authorities at this point for how ICE can release someone, and some of them are listed there. These are the most common. Um, but really, at the end of the day, ICE has the authority and the discretion to release everyone in its custody, including those who are subject to mandatory detention that we just talked about. That statute really only limits immigration judges, but ICE has the authority, and sometimes, occasionally, rarely now, will exercise that authority, even for people subject to mandatory detention. If ICE does not grant release under their discretion, and, and backing up briefly, they, they will release on what's known as release on recognizance, really similar, similar to, to criminal law. 
Um, but if they're not released by ICE, we can seek custody redetermination by the immigration court. This requires proof of a sponsor, lack of criminal activity, and that the person is not a flight risk. The statutory minimum for bond is $1,500, and unlike in the criminal legal system, immigration bonds must be paid in full. In reality, immigration bonds are typically $10,000, $15,000. That's a lot of money for a recently arrived asylum seeker fleeing horrific violence in their home country. And we're fortunate to work with many bond funds who, who will put up the money for, for the migrants who are um, granted bond. And then the third way is to file a writ of habeas corpus in federal district court. Um, we did this a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly for people with medical vulnerabilities, stating that in civil immigration confinement, the risk of COVID-19 to someone who is medically vulnerable constitutes an impermissible uh, uh, punishment for, for civil immigration confinement. Um, we were moderately successful depending on the jurisdiction, but habeas can also be used to challenge prolonged detention uh, for asylum seekers who are held beyond their 90-day deportation period or otherwise subjected to prolonged detention. And I will stop and pass it to Anna, who's going to walk us through some of the situations in New Mexico. So again, we come from New Mexico. and New Mexico, we have three immigration detention centers. Um, Torrance County Detention Facility, located in the town of Estancia, New Mexico. And interestingly, I grew up um, just like 30 minutes. It's in the same county that I grew up in, uh, very rural New Mexico. And actually, all of these are in very rural New Mexico. Um, Cibola County Correctional Center, um, that is located in Milan, New Mexico. And then we have Otero County Processing Center, and that one is located in Chaparral, New Mexico. Um, so these are somewhat numbers um, as of January 2023. Um, but for example, at Torrance, we were, that's one that we're closest to, so we're able to visit that facility most often. Um, at around right before Christmas time, we had only five immigrants still detained, and then we saw an influx of people being transferred there. We were hoping it was going to get closed, actually. Um, and then we saw an influx of uh, immigrants being transferred there from the border. There's about 300 people, if not more, probably transferred uh, by the first few weeks of January. So from five, and then all of a sudden, you know, we had this huge transfer. Um, so, talking about Torrance, um, first of all, all these centers are horrific conditions. Like, if I think if they were a regular um, prison, these probably would have been shut down a long time ago. Um, but because they're immigration detention centers, I think there is a lot of lack of knowledge. Also, even if the media tries to help, it doesn't get picked up very much by media. Um, at Torrance, for example, um, this last year there was a lot of rain out in Torrance and there was a lot of leaks happening in the roof. Um, so you would see water, they literally were just putting buckets underneath the leaks. Um, and then there was mosquitoes, so there's like a mosquito infestation. And just with all of that comes the hygiene. We would see water fountains that haven't been cleaned. And this is things that we could see walking in and being placed in like the visitation rooms or visitation areas. Um, so we can't even imagine what it looked like in the facilities where just the immigrants were sleeping. And they would tell us, our mattresses are soaked through. We can't even lay down on our mattresses, and yet nothing is happening, and they just didn't care. Um, also, at all three, we see horrible food. So we know people that are diabetic have special dietary restrictions. Um, we don't see also just um, uh, uh, people from Latin America. We also were seeing a lot of people from other countries where they have specific um, dietary needs according to their religion, and those weren't being observed either. So they get very bland food. Uh, many times they tell us that they don't even know what the protein is that they are receiving, but then we would hear of cases where they knew an inspection was coming up, the facility would know there was an inspection, and that day they would get chicken. So this is just some of the information we get directly from our clients. In Torrance, we also, um, in August, had a, um, had a case of one of our clients, well, not one of our clients, but someone that actually committed suicide um, in that facility. He was a young Brazilian man, um, and it just goes to show how horrible the conditions are at these centers. Um, people that are showing they have mental health um, problems or they're experiencing some mental health uh, problems, what they do is they put them in solitary confinement. 
Um, so that is the solution they have to this. And especially if they're saying they're having suicidal ideation, they put them in solitary confinement, they put them in very bare clothing, and the reasoning behind this is so that they don't harm themselves with the clothing. Um, these rooms are very cold, and the, um, we, our clients have told us the only, we know that the only way we'll be taken out of solitary confinement is if we say we're fine and that we're no longer thinking about killing ourselves. So they are lying to the mental health professionals that go to them um, and tell them that they're feeling fine in order to be removed. Solitary confinement amongst people Latin America is known as el hoyo, which translates to the hole. So just to put it in perspective. Um, uh, at Cibola, another center right now, we know that there is a rat infestation happening. So um, people, the, again, the food is very bad. They can get commissary and pay for this food. People, you know, their family members are either already in the U.S. or abroad uh, deposit money into their accounts, or even local organizations, you know, help uh, these people receive money so that they can purchase commissary food. But now with the rat infestation, like that isn't safe either. If, it's ha if it stays just overnight, they've seen droppings right next to their food. It's sealed packages, and they see where the rats have actually bitten into it. Um, you know, and they can no longer eat that because it's very unhealthy. Um, Otero, the other center too, um, we know that this is a place where there's both men and women in this location. Uh, for the other two, it's just men. Um, and they also have a trans uh, unit at Otero, but still the treatment is horrible. Um, another thing we know about Otero, especially with the COVID pandemic and disaster, is they were actually doing mandatory vaccinations of people. Um, so the people didn't have a choice and they didn't want to get these vaccines because you know the side effects that many people experience with the COVID vaccine and then experiencing it in these conditions. They're already really cold. People were shivering with their fevers and just getting worse. And again, the only way to really help with this was solitary confinement. So that's really kind of the band-aid they use. Um, and anytime they would seek medical assistance outside of mental health, um, they have to sign up on a list Usually the doctors or medical professionals, many times it isn't even doctors, um, are in the evening or very late evening. Again, this is rural, so it's whenever they say they're going to show up um, and they wouldn't receive the help they need or sometimes they would just get like, oh, their pressure taken or their temperature taken. Oh, you're fine. Here, have an aspirin. When people are experiencing actual um, health issues um, and this is all they could really do is continue asking for help but not receiving it. Uh, we have people who have been detained that have also, um, I had a client that was HIV positive, um, and that was the reason he was fleeing his country also. Um, he was a gay man, um, and he was terrified of his country that his people, his own brother, find out that he have HIV because of the discrimination that they experience in their home country. Um, he notified them that he had HIV, and he was being given medication. He had no idea the name of the medication, but in order to just try to keep his HIV in check, he was taking it. So was it actually HIV medication? I don't know. Um, but I would ask him, you know, any information that he could provide. And I'm like, well, what's the name of the medication you received at home? And he would tell me the name. And it's like, well, is that the same medication you're receiving here? Thinking like, oh, he'll tell me the name. I can research it and see if it's the same. And he wouldn't know the name of the medication even after he asked. Um, so here you can see also um, just some of the other conditions that the people have experienced. We also see a lot of spread of illness, um, measles, COVID again, scabies, um, just because they're in very confined spaces. Whenever the centers have a lot of people, they cram a lot of people into these rooms. So there really isn't space for them to be healthy. It's very unhygienic. Like I said, water fountains, when we can see there's mold on the water fountains, you can only, you know, figure that the water fountains in the different locations and our clients tell us how horrible the conditions are. Um, and that not even being able to like have a cup, you know, it's just very inhumane that if anyone, I mean, it's just very inhumane conditions. Um, we have had cases also and clients where um, people are committing suicide in these facilities. Um, we have a, we had a client that he attempted suicide, um, but some of the people in his pod or in his area were able to see him, um, and so they helped him so he wouldn't die. Um, and they were seeking out help from the guards and from the facility personnel. 
and it took them 20 minutes to arrive. So if it wasn't for the other immigrants in the same location, this person would have been successful in their suicide attempt. Um, the other thing is this personnel, as Sophia was saying, very xenophobic. Um, they taunt the immigrants, they call them names. Um, we have a case of a client who um, had lost an eye in his home country by gang violence, and so he only had one eye, and the correctional people would actually call him pirate. So, I mean, it's just really bad, and you can, we've also been told uh, they can see where some of these people have, like, maybe even, like, the swastika, and they try to cover it up um, on their, you know, and it's just a lot of white supremacy that we see, a lot of name calling, treating them very badly, and most of these people don't speak English, of course, and so that's another thing that really gets used against them in order to have access to any services. You walk into the building and you see there's all these posters for like, if you need help, call this number or call this number. Um, sometimes those posters are just in English. Uh, sometimes the numbers, our clients tell us, you've been trying to get assistance and we call the number and there's never a response. So it's just, it's very horrific. We have clients that tell us, I have had clients tell me specifically, he's like, I left a country where I was being threatened, I was shot at, and he's like, I know I'll die if I go back, but if I knew I was coming to this, I would never have left. So I think, in my personal opinion, it's just, it, they're doing this on purpose in order to deter people to come to the U.S., even if they are seeking asylum. Also, we sometimes don't have communication with our clients. We try to contact them, and they're like, oh, we can't reach them right now, or oh, they're doing a count right now, um, or oh, they have COVID, so we had to put them in, in their own room, you know, in solitary, they don't call it solitary confinement, I don't remember the name the officials use, but that's like an excuse also for us not to be able to speak to our clients. Um, also, our clients not being able to speak to family members, making outgoing calls or receiving calls from family members, um, it goes for extended periods of time. So you can only imagine the impact this has on a person's mental health. Um, next slide, please. So what we're doing um, in New Mexico uh, to kind of fight back, I guess. We do make a lot of civil rights and civil liberties complaints, which it's very interesting because I recently learned, I knew about these complaints, I didn't know the outcome of them, and Sophia actually shared with me the response. The response she received in the email is like, thank you for filing the complaint, we'll file it away and put it in our database. Like, that is the response, not we're gonna investigate this right away, we're gonna see what's happening, it's like, thank you for letting us know. We'll take, make note of it. Um, we also know that the Office of the Inspector General has actually made inspections and has actually said that these centers need to be closed down, and yet they're not closed. Again, these are privately run facilities. So in New Mexico, we have Core Civic and Management and Training Company, MTC, that run these detention centers. So they're for-profit detention centers. Um, they make an exorbitant amount of money, um, whenever there are, a, there are lawsuits against these centers, we know that they actually have a budget for settlements because it's easier for them to just pay out whenever it comes to lawsuits um, rather than, you know, being able, willing to say, go to trial because they know they'll lose it for any of these complaints. So just really bad. And then also it's taxpayer money. So your money is actually going to pay these private prison facilities um, in order to hold these immigrants. Um, and they have, they're usually paid by quotas of bed spaces that are filled, um, and there's minimums that have to be filled, um, and it's paid depending by ICE, by the county, depending on the contracts that happen. Um, this year, we actually did try to do a bill in our New Mexico legislature um, for an intergovernmental I forget the, that Intergovernmental S. Services Agreement Services ban. Agreement. <laughs> I always forget the S. Services Agreement uh, ban. And that's just to limit our state government from making these contracts with the private detention facilities, with the companies themselves. Um, and unfortunately, we found out yesterday when it went to the Senate that it did not pass. Um, so it's been, you know, an uphill battle constantly. Um, even though ICE would have still been able to have the contracts directly with the detention facilities if the detention if the company owned the detention center, we at least wanted to remove New Mexico from this. 
Um, Otero County owns the detention facility, so they have a direct contract um, with uh, MTC, and so we're trying to sever that and hopefully close that center down. But with the non-passage now, we're still in the same boat. And what all of this has demonstrated to immigration practitioners across the country and certainly at the NMILC is the limits of the law and the limits of what lawyers can do, which is why being part of movement is so critical in these spaces and this advocacy that we're doing. Um, for, for me personally, it's, it's you know acknowledging that as a lawyer, I am working in a dehumanizing system every single day and I have to deal with working within this system because my clients have real needs right now and it's critical that I navigate that system well for them to meet their immediate needs. But litigating in this existing system does nothing to change it. And that's where movement lawyering comes in, that's where advocacy and partnership with our clients, with community organizers is so critical. And it's that people power that ultimately reshapes policy, radically reforms the way reforms or restructures the way we think through things and it's not dependent upon several years long litigation where you're looking at one issue that occurred five years ago that litigation's pending for five ten years but there's about 80 other issues that have come up since then so we work a lot in community and it's important that we not only center the lived experiences of our clients but are ensuring that they have a seat at the table my colleague Jordan um, was talking about this earlier, and it's not just including voices and demanding the labor of our clients who are busy trying to regularize their status and become accustomed to a new country and, and, and get their lives together and meet their basic needs. Um, it's not fair to depend on them to do the work. It's up to us to do the work and then compensate those with lived experience to come to the table and take leadership positions uh, within these spaces. It's also organizing with communities where these facilities are located. And we have partnered with another great organization, Innovation Law Lab, and they are community organizers, they're not lawyers. And they're in these communities speaking with folks on the ground about what are the needs, what are the concerns, and having really meaningful conversations about um, the, the facility. And we have found that at least one mayor does not want to be in the private prison industry, but he's afraid to say that out loud. He's dependent upon the financial benefits of the facility, as, limited, as limiting as they might be to one industry, but he wants support so desperately from the state of New Mexico to diversify the economies in these, in these rural places. Um, but this, this dependency upon private prison companies makes it really, really difficult to change the situation. So in addition to the legislation that unfortunately did not pass yesterday, we have these CRCL complaints. As Anna mentioned, they go nowhere. We get a note that they've been filed. But it's important that we continue filing these complaints because it creates a paper record. And we go to our federal delegation, say, hey, look at all these complaints. Absolutely nothing has been done. What are you going to do about it? and continuing to nag the decision makers to the point of exhaustion and hopefully they will give up and you know bend to our will and close these really dangerous sites and framing it not only one is uh, of an importance of humanity but also one of liability these sites are becoming more and more dangerous because it's not profitable for these private prison companies to meet basic needs and they have built into their budget litigation liability payouts and the more we file litigation, the more we complain, the louder we are, the bigger that liability becomes. Um, and we've become very, very powerful in a short amount of time in New Mexico through this community organizing and bringing in people that you don't ordinarily see in these spaces. We work a lot with faith groups, a lot of older white ladies who have deep pockets, who have been really, really fabulous in terms of making sure and providing mutual aid to folks on the inside to you know, pay for food and, and commissary and phone calls home. And in that process, we at NMILC are educating them about the racial injustices that are occurring in this detention, rejecting white saviorism, which is really important in, in those dynamics. Um, and again, just building this movement across the state to reject immigration detention. Um, it's going to be a several years long fight, unfortunately, after our loss yesterday. 
but we were continuing to do this um, and hopefully we'll, we'll succeed not only here but in other states across the country. Um, another thing I'd like to add to is many of our clients, um, I, and I would like to think is because they see us working so hard for them and fighting, they say they want to go public with their stories, right? So here we can actually even see um, that is a picture of uh, a person that was in immigration detention and they want to share their stories. Um, we have volunteers that go out and take statements of people that want to share their stories so that we can continue putting it out in the media. Um, sharing it with our legislature um, so that people can find out what's going on. We also see movement happy, happening um, internally, independently of anyone getting involved of hunger strikes. You could go home and YouTube hunger strike immigration detention and there is a documentary on, um, I believe he's an Indian man who was force fed because he was doing a hunger, hunger strike. So um, we know that, you know, our, even these people are in immigration detention. Yes, it's horrible, but they're still trying to fight and they're still trying to stay and they want to share this story. Many of them, unfortunately, do get deported. Um, so we aren't able to continue with the movement with them at our side. But even being back in their home country where they've been deported to or even moving to a different location once they're deported, they want to continue sharing their story. So we have had um, some few uh, webcasts where, or phone calls where they call in and we can hear them and, you know, they can tell us what they experienced firsthand. So that was all very, I don't want to say depressing, but it's a lot working in this space and, and where we have found power and strength is in our clients and their resiliency and our community partners. It takes people power to disrupt systems of white supremacy and, and that's what we're going to continue doing. But that's it. And we're happy to answer any questions y'all may have. I know immigration law is unique for perhaps this group. It, it's certainly different than, than the other panels. So we're happy to answer any questions y'all have. Thanks. <laughs>
It's fascinating you say that because I worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center in rural, middle of nowhere, Georgia, right across the street from the Irwin County Detention Facility, and we were in a double-wide trailer in a field across from this ginormous facility that held men and women. And for those who do not know, the Irwin County Detention Facility is the notorious facility that provided and gave unwanted gynecological procedures to women. Um, it eventually closed, it, it no longer opens, but what happened is these women were, were instead transferred to Stewart, and, and the really horrific conditions are certainly prevalent in Georgia, New Mexico, I've also been up in New York, they're, they're everywhere, and it's because of this lack of accountability. Great question. Um, I wish my executive director was here <laughs> to, to hold my hand through this because she's she certainly guided us. Um, we acted as legal experts for SB 172 to implement an IGSA ban in New Mexico. And there's a fine line certainly between education about the conditions in these facilities and direct lobbying saying you should pass this bill. But even then, a certain amount of direct lobbying is permitted under, uh, under for nonprofits. I think the, the number might be 20%, 25%. I'm sure there's someone in this room who knows better than I do. Um, so it, it's more extensive than you might think. We're also not LSC funded. We um, Immigration largely is not LSC funded at all. I, I don't think at all. So we have like 18 different grants that we have to report to because it's largely foundational money, sometimes occasionally government money or state money. So it's it's different sources too. Yeah, so the question is, um, for seeking release from immigration detention, can you use COVID-19 as a basis for seeking release? It's a complicated <laughs> answer. Also a full CLE. Um, there was litigation called Fry Hot the Ice. It actually started when I was at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and it was litigating conditions, particularly for medically vulnerable people in detention. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, it transformed into something else. Um, and there was an injunction stating that people with certain medical vulnerabilities must be released from ICE detention, or not must, but it is strongly encouraged that ICE exercise their discretion to release medically vulnerable individuals from custody. Um, that injunction expired. However, you are still able to use the existing authorities uh, to justify the release of someone who is medically vulnerable from from custody, it's just it, it's just called something else. Um, but again, that litigation was fry hot the ice, and it was strongly encouraged. But the client I was talking about that was HIV positive, we actually filed for him under that, and he wasn't released. Actually, they moved him a few times, and I actually lost him because I would call detention centers. They're like, he's not here anymore. And then I would call like the different one where they would usually go in El Paso and they're like, no, he's not here. We don't know what you're talking about. He ended up in Arizona for a little bit and he would be able to reach out to me. So it's very complicated um, when it comes to that. And then the other thing too is that we know that they're not getting adequate medical attention. So even whenever they did have certain conditions, they weren't being treated, they weren't being documented. The Georgia case, for example, you can actually um, listen whenever they were before Congress uh, at the committee hearings. And they're talking, doctors that were expert witnesses were talking about the lack of documentation and medical records. 
And that was one of the reasons that women were getting hysterectomies and getting sterilized. And yet there was no reason for it. There's no documentation behind it by the doctors that were doing it at that time. So super cheerful stuff, um, but I appreciate y'all listening in. I, again, I know it's a, a different body of law for everyone. Um, and let us know if you have any other questions. We'll be around, but thank you. Thank you. So as we wrap up, we want to say thank you again. You both did a phenomenal job. So another round of applause. Thank you. So we are now going to be wrapping up the uh, end of day one. So we are so excited. Um, and we are going to be gathering in the Banyan Courtyard for a reception beginning at 5 p.m. So feel free to go to the restroom, take care of anything you need to before. Um, so we can kind of hang out, socialize, and enjoy ourselves. Just want to let you know, we are going to be sending you all a survey at the conclusion of the symposium. So if you have any notes about anything you enjoyed or you want to see us do better, feel free to write those notes down. So when you get the survey, you can just add that right into there, okay? And if you have, all have any questions, let us know. But if nothing else, 